Well, praise God. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Gospel Saving Church. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Praise be to God. I hope you guys are here today to learn and not to be entertained. That was something that I just got this morning when I was finishing up my sermon. I was on my last part of my, or I was working through the last, I, I do a, a very last like touch up on Sunday mornings just to tweak it. And you know, if there's something I felt like the Lord wanted me to add. And so I was just doing that this morning and I felt like this big impression of, I hope people don't come here to get entertained because that's not why people ought to come to church. Amen. And that is not what God, that's not what Jesus did. Jesus didn't have church to entertain people. He had church to teach people. So I hope you came here today to be taught and not to be entertained. Anyway, if this is your first time here, listen to me. Hello, I'm Pastor Ed. I'm a little sick today, so excuse me if I don't sound the same. I come to you from McKinney, Texas. This is Gospel Saving Church, one of God's true churches of these last days. And this is our weekly broadcast of truth from God's Word. We always start with a word of prayer, so if you guys would please join me. And then as uh, I pray, please pray for me after that the Lord would get me through this sickness that I'm almost through. I'm almost done. That's why I'm here today. And uh, let's pray and ask God to bless this message. Lord, thank you so much for uh, bringing us here. Thank you so much, Lord God, for making the provision, Lord, because as I said earlier, if this was yesterday or Friday, I probably wouldn't have been able to go, Lord. I felt really, 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 really bad yesterday and the day before. So today, praise you, God. I woke up this morning feeling great, uh, a little raspy right now, but I feel terrific. I'm on the, I'm on the other side. So, Lord, I just uh, pray you give me a voice today to say your words. And I pray you give the people that are here and the people that are listening online all over the world, I pray you give them the, uh, the ears to listen to, Lord God. And, Lord, of course, as you always put on my heart, Lord, give us not only the ears to listen, give us the ears to hear that we may do, Lord, what your word says to do. Lord, help us just not to be hearers of your word only. God, you didn't have anything good to say about those that were hearers only. God, it's those that do your word for for in doing lord is the repentance that's necessary to walk with you lord for repentance is turning away from one to another it's, it's turning your back on it about face lord towards you so lord i pray that we would all come to repentance today if there's anything in your word that we're not doing that we should be doing that your word says we should be doing so lord we thank you and we love you and we praise you and we ask your blessing on this message and all of us as well. And we pray, Lord God, our gathering together to you and our obedience to you, Lord God, would also uh, bless your heart too as well too. Bring a smile to your face today, Lord. I know this world and the, the sin that is in it right now, Lord God, doesn't really give you too much to smile about. But Lord, I pray that us being here and being faithful to you through all that we've been through, Lord, to be here, I pray that would bring a smile to your face. We thank you. We love you. And we praise you. And we ask these things in Jesus Christ's mighty name. Amen. So you can turn now to Acts chapter 6. We're going to be in verses 8 through 15, but I'm not going to read them or teach them until after my thoughts from last week's message, the distribution of duties. Last week, we took a good look at a problem that had arisen in the Christ church in Jerusalem. What was that problem? Well, remember the Greek-speaking Jewish widows uh, were being neglected in the daily distribution by the Jewish-speaking members who were feeding everybody except for they were neglecting them. That was a big, big problem. So they were not being given their proper portions of food at the times the church was providing food for their members. The reason this was even a problem in the first place was that there was no strong, mature Christian personal leadership or oversight over that ministry. And there was just not enough ministry people to do the work anyway. So the disciples, as they were led of God, suggested that they not personally oversee the daily distribution ministry because of their calling from God, which was, again, to lead the whole entire church, not to wait on tables, but that the church leaders and members pick out seven strong, young Christian men who were mature in their faith to be personal, the personal oversight needed for this ministry. The church leadership members loved their suggestion as they realized it was divine or really from God. And because of it, they prospered. Remember, the church continued to grow because they did the things that God wanted to do the God's ways. Right? We could do things. We talked about that. We could do things our ways or we do things God's ways. Right? But they practiced things that God wanted them to do, the distribution of duties. Because remember, God didn't call one or two or even a few people to serve the masses. He made all people really to serve him, right? And they gave each of them their personal ability 
and, and expects, especially those that get saved, to use these gifts and talents that he gives us for the benefit of all of his kingdom and for all his kids and for all of his church. We even looked at the scripture that talked about that. I believe it was 1 Corinthians. And really, I can't say too much more today about this topic than what I already taught it last week, what I just said just now. So today I'm just going to, I want to encourage all my brothers and sisters out there to get busy serving God for his kingdom. A starting, of course, with inside his church. As a Christian man or a Christian woman, your first duty is your first ministry is your family. That's the way it should go. Of course, your first devotion should be to God. Then after that, your first ministry is your family. And then after that, your, your second ministry is the church, God's church. Because too many churches have a deficiency of servants and ministries, especially those that are wise and those that are, you know, those that have been Christians for a while. So Christians, especially mature believers, I encourage you. I mean, look what Christ did for you. Christ paid the ultimate price. We just talked about it in communion today. Get serving God for his kingdom in the church. And then, of course, after in the church, the next ministry is outside the walls of the church. As one of our brothers even went out just the other day to go breach outside the walls of the church. So praise God for that. But Christians, there's too many people that God, there's too many people needed inside the church for you to just sit there on the pews and to keep them warm. That's not why God made you to be a pew warmer. All right, well, let's get into our new sermon for today, shall we? I love the title. God gave this title to me as a last second title. <laughs> Practically, no, he reminds me, there's one other time when I got a title that was like right before, literally, as I think I was standing up here teaching, then he gave me the title. This one he gave to me just about a, like an hour or so ago, maybe, maybe an hour and a half ago, but I love it. It's an awesome title. Here it is, ready? Stephen waits on tables and shuts down his debaters. That's an awesome title. That's exactly what this scripture is about. Stephen waits on tables and shuts down his debaters. Let's read Acts 6, 8 through 15, and let's see what God has to say to us today. Go to verse 8, Acts 6. You can listen along or you can read along with me. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. Then there arose some from what is called the synagogue of freedmen, Cyrenius, Alexandrius, and those from Cilicia and Asia, disputing with Stephen. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. Then they secretly induced men to say, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. And they stirred up the people and elders and the scribes, and they came upon him, seized him, and brought him to the council. They also set up false witnesses who said, This man does not cease to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs which Moses delivered to us. And all who sat at the council, looking steadfastly at him, saw his face as the face of an angel. Wow. Stephen, he was a waiter of tables, but when the time came, he, was a, he, he shut down those that debated against him. Isn't that awesome? So now, now the new group of mature, on-fire Christians have been chosen, right? Those that have, would take some of the burden or of oversight of the work of the Lord in the church off the apostles, and they've been prayed over. Remember, after they were chosen, the apostles prayed over them, and they sent them to work. Well, they go to work for the Lord, doing what God called them to do, feeding all God's people equally in the church. If you're in the faith, there's nothing better or greater for you to do than to fulfill God's calling on your life. That's it. That's it. I mean, really, we can have lots of personal exploits, and we do. But those things pale in comparison with you fulfilling what God has called you to do, whatever that is. Whatever that is. For my father, before he went home to be with the Lord, it was to be with my mom and to take care of her and to oversee her. Now that duty passes on to me and my family plus other things. For you, it may be you know, to be a deacon. For you, it may be to be a, a, a pastor. For you, it may be to be an usher, a children's ministry, a donut ministry, but never whatever. God called you for a purpose, like I talked about last sermon, and there's nothing greater for you to do in all your life than to fulfill the calling or callings that God has given you to do. There's an old saying, and I love it. <clears throat> One life will soon be passed, 
Only what's done for Christ will last. Anything you do for yourself all just perishes away. It all just goes away, flies away. Goodbye as a birdie when you die. But whatever you do for Christ, that brings eternal rewards forever when you die. So just be aware of that. Anyway, so getting back to the scripture. As these guys are feeding all the masses of the Christian believers there in the church, look at how the Bible says that they do it. Well, one of them anyway, because interesting fact here, Stephen is the only one we actually hear about doing anything after the seven are chosen. We hear about a man named Philip, but we know what scripture says that the apostles, Philip was an original apostle, but not this one, they stuck to what God called them to do. So nobody else other than Stephen, we don't hear about anybody else ever doing anything for the waiting on tables and serving in this ministry other than Stephen here. But let's look how Stephen does this ministry that God has given him to be overseer and server in. Look at verse 8 again. And Stephen, full of faith and power, that's important, remember that, full of faith and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. Stephen, while leading and waiting on tables, serving and feeding God's people during the daily distribution, does great wonders and signs among the people as he was doing what God called him to do. That's, that's awesome. That's powerful. You can't tell me that God doesn't see every ministry the same. Stephen was a nobody. I mean, of course, he was a child of God, but he wasn't a figure in the church before the church chose him to serve these tables and to oversee this ministry. Now, all of a sudden, Stephen is chosen. He's serving in this ministry. He's overseeing this ministry. He's waiting on tables is what he's doing. He, I mean, that to me, that if I looked at the church's ministries from a human perspective, there's probably no lower, from a, from a, a human perspective, there's no lower ministry than serving people at a table, being a waiter. In, for God's kingdom, okay? I would say lots of ministries were above that, but that's from a human perspective. In God's eyes, Stephen, while doing this for God, God allows him to do great wonders and signs among the people. God sees all ministries serving for him as the same. He doesn't, it doesn't matter whether you're waiting on tables, whether you're teaching, whether you're serving donuts, whether you're serving coffee, whether you're cleaning the sanctuary after church, it doesn't matter. God did wonders and signs, great, excuse me, wonders and signs in this church with a table waiter. That's awesome. Christians, don't let anyone ever tell you that any work that you do for God is less important than any other calling for God that you could do. Well, I'm, a, I'm an evangelist. I don't, I don't serve coffee. Well, yeah, you're, you're just a toe. Okay, there's a hand, there's a foot, there's a leg, there's an eye, there's a mouth. Doesn't matter. It's all one body. God sees it all the same. Everybody's important. Because Luke just records here of Stephen the waiter, that almost was the title, doing the same kinds of great, amazing, and supernatural works for God just by waiting tables for the Lord for this church as the apostles had done. And there was only 12 of them. And this Stephen, a table waiter, did the same kind of works that they were doing as he fulfilled his calling for the Lord. So no matter what work God has called you to do, whether you think it's small or large, it's important to God. He sees it as important and don't let anybody tell you that he doesn't. And God can do it through you with great miracles or miraculous workings just like he did with Stephen here. No matter whether you think it's small to God, he sees it as big, as great, as large because you're doing it for him. So you're doing it for him. You're doing it for his church. You're doing it for his people. And that, God sees, is big no matter what you're doing. If he calls you to do it, then you do it. Now, now, off of that, just for a moment, I love this next section, though. With all that I just said and how important it was, I don't, want us to miss the, I don't want us to miss the reason why the Bible says Stephen was able to do these amazing miracles and supernatural works for God. According to verse 6, he did them full of faith and power. Isn't that awesome? Can't miss that in Scripture. He did them full of faith and power. Christians, this is the only way any child of God could do any work for God. Full of faith 
and power. Anytime you're trying, if you, you could serve God in your own power. A lot of people do it. And you know what you get? You get stale. You get burned out. You, I can't do this anymore. You have to have, you have to be full of faith. You have to believe. You have to put all your trust in God. You have to totally believe, hey, this is what he's called me to do. I believe it. Hey, God, I'm going to go for you like gangbusters. And that's just it. I believe. Because if you don't, you won't last. True ministries are known not by their springing up fast and then dying off. True ministries, and I, I mean, I guess you could say this for all, kind of what, kind of like what the religious leader said the last couple sermons ago, but true, true ministries are known by not necessarily their great amounts of people that they have following them or the great amount of this or great amount of that. It's, it's are they willing to stick through the times that are tough and good and keep going because they're full of faith and power. And the only way you could do that is if you're full of faith and power for God doing those things. Praise God. Changing course to a true and sad and, of course, a less desirable topic that we see in our text today. Unfortunately, we see here in the text the same rule of thumb as we have seen previously in the New Testament. Look at verse 9 to see what it is. Then there arose some from what is called the synagogue of the freedmen. I really call it the synagogue of Satan. I think this is who Jesus was maybe talking about in the book of Revelations. Uh, Cyrenius, Alexandria, and those from Cilicia and Asia. So some religious Jews who basically were against Jesus Christ. They didn't believe that the Christ had come. And they came disputing with Stephen. Now, so they were Jews. They were in the temple. Remember, that's where the Christians were having their church, in the temple. That's where they were doing things. That's where they were operating. And so some Jews who were from the synagogue of freedmen or Satan come and they dispute with him. Hey, what are you, what are you doing? What are you doing? What are you teaching? What are you talking about? What are you serving these tables for? And, and unfortunately, the rule of thumb that we see here was this. God was moving in a mighty way through Stephen, doing all these wonders and signs and all these things, doing all these miracles, whatever. And what happens? The devil sends people among them to do what? In order to try to destroy God's work. The devil cannot keep out of God's work. We've seen this throughout the whole New Testament. Whenever God was moving through, whenever Jesus, which was God, was moving in a mighty way, Satan would come and try to throw him down, try to destroy his work. Whenever the apostles, in the last few chapters we've been looking over, whenever the apostles were doing great signs and wonders and miracles, and people were getting saved, whatever, well, then they were arrested. And they were pulled away, and then they were set on trial, and the devil tried to destroy him. The evil one just can't stand it when God moves mightily, and we see it again throughout the whole New Testament, again and again and again, and we see it here again with Stephen. Word to the wise Christians. If God starts using you in mighty ways, be warned, Satan's coming. You can guarantee it. If Scripture says it's so, it's so. And that's just the way it is. Uh, scripture doesn't lie. God doesn't lie. If you're, God's moving you in mighty ways, be ready. Watch out. Satan's coming. Excuse me. Now, in, case, now in this case, was Satan, uh, was Satan through them able to show him up? Was he able to shut him down? Was he able to destroy God's work? Right? Look at verse 10. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. Praise God. This is so exciting. I only wish. In fact, I was thinking about it during sermon when I was setting up the sermon. I, 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 I wish that we had Stephen's words of debate. I wish we did. I wish we were there. Like I could have had a, a voice recorder. What was he saying? Because we don't get any of the debate here. We only get that they came disputing with him, and then we only get, and they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. Now, I can't wait till I get to heaven, because one of the things I'm going to do is sit around for probably a few eternities, and I'm going to go to all the apostles and all the disciples, and, and I'm going to go to Jesus. I'm going, what did you say in this section? Well, what did you say through Stephen? How was he able to shut down those, those guys, right? Jesus, what did you say on the road to Emmaus when you explained to them everything from the beginning and to now and all? You opened up the scriptures and their hearts burned within them. I can't wait to get there and learn all these things because, wow, it's just, it just so awesome. I, I think it's so awesome and exciting. I've seen God do it through me. I've seen God do it through others, but where you start to debate, talk to other people about the Lord, and they start to come back at you, but they can't refute because the Lord just shuts them down. The Lord just puts words in your mouth, and it's like, wow, boom, and it's like they can't refute, they can't debate, and it's like God shuts them up. 
what happened here with Stephen and these evil people, what's happened with me, what happened with others, uh, when others have come from him, you know, against against him, by, against us from Satan, was a fulfillment of what Jesus said in Luke 21, 15. He said to his original 12 disciples, they're all Christians till the end of time, that he would give them, or we could say us, mouths and wisdom, which all there, and you could say our, adversaries will not be able to contradict or resist. And this is, Christians, a promise of Jesus Christ. This is not just a passing thought. This was, Jesus said this would happen if you walked with him, this would happen to you even today. Christians, you have a wealth of knowledge in you by God, not by you. But the Holy Spirit living within you, if you're saved, if you're born again, the Holy Spirit's within you has, is a wealth. Of, think about it. God is eternal, right? God has all the wisdom and all the knowledge that ever. He, he is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge. Right? There was no, mankind was not, then they were, and then boom, God, he said, hey, here, have wisdom and knowledge. Everything's in him. There's nothing anybody could say, nothing that God cannot answer. <laughs> nothing so christians if you put yourself out there in ministry and, and oh but what am i going to say what am oh no what am i going to do hey you know what shut your mouth and let god speak just get yourself out there if lord calls you to do it go out there and say what and go out there and talk for the lord because he will answer through you words that others cannot refute and he promises it here and you see when god promises something when he gives a promise and nobody, come, nobody can break that. No man can break that. It's when he gives his word, he's a man of his word. Not like us. People lie. God, he's not a liar. And he gave his word here that when, if we'd speak for him, that he'd give us words that no one would be able to refute. Now, unfortunately for Stephen, uh, one of the other things that Jesus said was going to happen to his children in the future was about to happen to him in his new future. Uh, for in the same teaching Jesus gave us in Luke 21, he promised that his servants would also be betrayed and even put to death for his namesake. And sadly, this is how Stephen's story ends up in this section. Although Stephen was able to put him down and shut him up and while he was waiting tables and all that good stuff, he also, unfortunately, his story adds uh, and sad for him, uh, sad, good for him actually, but sad for those that are around him as of course he ended up, they ended up uh, killing him at the end of this. So anyway, back to our account with Stephen. Look at uh, in six here. So Stephen, by inspiration of God's Holy Spirit, had just put down the disputers, or, or had just put the disputers, excuse me, down in their place instead of the other way around. Praise God for that. But were those that Satan sent to attack him satisfied and okay with them being shut up and unable to respond? Unfortunately, look at verse 11. Then they secretly induced men to say, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. No, they were not. All caps, highlighted, underlined, everything. Why? Because they were sore losers. They were not only sent from Satan, but they were sore losers. Why? Stephen never spoke blasphemous words against God and Moses. And this proves that what I said about them being from Satan. Why? Because they were liars. And Jesus spoke of the evil one, John 8, 45. He is a, lot, he is a liar and the father of lies. And here, the, uh, godly men would have just taken the defeat and shut up and gone home. And especially they would have repented of what they were wrong about and accepted their correction. But these were not God's men. These were scoundrels as the Old Testament calls a lot of people scoundrels. These were scoundrels, these, these sore loser scoundrels. So are these evil sore loser followers of Satan done with their attack against God's true servant, Stephen? We could only wish. Look at verses 12 through 14. And they stirred up the people, the elders and the scribes, and they came upon him, seized him, and brought him to the council. So these sore losers take their evil to the next level and get the religious leaders involved. Stephen really was arrested and put on trial. Does this sound familiar to you? Does this sound familiar? Because it does to me. I mean, we just studied it, right? The last three, four chapters of the book of Acts. This happened twice to the apostles, right? They were doing great signs, wonders, miracles. Again, then God was moving. Boom, Satan comes in, attacks. They arrest him. They put him on trial. They do the same thing to here. They escalate their anger and rage for being shut up. They just could not stand the fact that they were wrong. They couldn't stand the fact that they could not answer Stephen. And they go, and what do they do? 
They set up false witnesses, notice that's plural, against him, who lie and say, this man speaks blasphemous words against this holy place and their law. So they spread more and more and more lies, and they even did it by roping others into their scheme against Stephen and causing them to lie, probably paying them off or bribing them, right? And that's usually what they did. They probably went people and they incited on it. Hey, man, I'll give you, I'll give you a few denarii or whatever, and I'll give you a couple pieces of gold. if you, Hey, just come here and say this thing about Stephen, right? And the Bible has nothing, no good thing to say about those who take bribes, give bribes, and those who bear false witness. Proverbs 17, 23. A wicked man. Notice that right there. That, that's not a good term. A wicked man accepts a bribe behind the back to pervert the ways of justice. And that's what these guys were doing. They were wicked men, right, perverting justice. God gave them justice. God shut them up. And what did they do? They weren't good with that. So they perverted justice by giving bribes and taking bribes. Proverbs 21, 14. A gift in secret pacifies anger and, the, and a bribe behind the back strong wrath. And look at a false witness, sadly. Proverbs 19, 9. A false witness will not go unpunished and he who speaks lies shall perish. Ouch. The biblical punishment for a false witness in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 19, 18, and 19. Uh, for, for the Jewish people, which these people would have fallen under that, and the judges shall make careful inquiry. And indeed, if the witness is a false witness, he who testifies falsely against his brother, then you shall do to him as he thought to have done to his brother. So you shall put away the evil from before you. So these people should have been put away. And really, a false witness is nothing but a liar. And the eternal punishment for a practicing liar under the new covenant covenant probably the old covenant also but just for our now and our future time right jesus revelation 28 but the cowardly the unbelieving it's all wrapped together mind you it's all each one of these is all anything practiced here the cowardly unbelieving abominable murderers sexually immoral sorcerers idolaters and all liars false witness shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone which is the second death so in case so in this case well, these that bribed and these that took a bribe and gave the false witness, unless they repented and turned to Christ. And hey, you know, who knows? I hope they did, but you know, you never know. Unless they repented and turned to Christ and stopped practicing these sins that I just mentioned, spend a terribly long stay, are spending, I should say, a terribly long stay in the horrible place of hell where their worms, as the Bible says, will never die and their fires will never be quenched. Wow, that's ouch. I'll tell you, even though Stephen was murdered for what happened here, I would rather be murdered and go to heaven and stand before God as a martyr, standing for his word, than be a liar and die and go to hell forever. Wow. I love my life. I love the life God's given me, and I love my family, and I love the ministry and all that good stuff. But I tell you, there's nothing better to go to stand before God and say, well done, good and faithful servant, especially when you die as a martyr. How exactly did they say he lied? Look at verse 14. For we had heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs which Moses delivered to us. Now, these things they claim Stephen say here are partially true. And, but you know, partial truths are often lies. What's the partial truth or lie that they give? Well, they say that Stephen said that Jesus of Nazareth would destroy this place. Did Stephen or even Jesus Christ teach this? Well, at least Jesus Christ did partially. Uh, so Stephen might have also, you know, being a disciple of his, uh, Jesus, Matthew 24, 1 through 2. Then Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came up to show him the buildings of the temple. Oh, hey, look at all these buildings, Jesus. Look at how glorious they are. Oh, aren't they magnificent? And the temple of God at that time was really magnificent. It was pretty fantastic. Yeah, and Jesus said to them, do you not see all these things? Surely I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. Basically, Jesus said, all this stuff that you see is all going to be destroyed. And of course, with no temple, meant also following God in the way that the Jews did would have to change too, right? So Jesus Christ never said that he 
would destroy the place of Jerusalem and all the holy buildings that they knew of. But he did say that they would be destroyed, giving a prophecy. And we know that that prophecy was fulfilled in 70 AD when Titus, the Roman governor, Roman general, came in and completely burned and destroyed all of Jerusalem, completely not even leaving one stone left upon another. But nevertheless, here, these guys, these wicked and evil sore loser men, that were followers of Satan, they told a partial truth. Stephen, nor Jesus Christ, never said he would destroy these things, or he would be the one. They told a partial truth, which was a terrible lie. Just to get Stephen in trouble with the religious leaders and get him on trial, which unfortunately led to his demise, which makes these guys not only sore losers, but according to our American law, even if you participate in having somebody murdered, you are in fact guilty of first degree murder. So these guys here would also be murderers as well as also sore losers, followers of Satan and liars. Boy, their, their laundry list of sin just goes on and on and on, right? These deplorable men. Excuse me, I need a sip of water. <clears throat> in our last verse, verse 15, and all who sat in the council looking steadfastly at him saw his face as the face of an angel, our last verse. So all those who were sitting in the council or the religious leaders who had come together to put Stephen on trial for the evils that he supposedly said, look at him for his response to the accusations that they made against him. Now, sadly here, uh, and in this case here, we really see that God wasn't going to deliver Stephen because with all the things that were said against him, I doubt that there was any defense that he could have given for himself that would have delivered him from their hands because after all, these sore losers, these evil people, followers of Satan, who were uh, had set up, remember verse 11, multiple witnesses. That means there were two or more to lie for them and say that Stephen said those blasphemous things. And remember, in the Jewish ancient, ancient text, the Old Testament or Old Covenant that God set up for his kids, Deuteronomy 19, 15 said this, One witness shall not rise against a man concerning any iniquity or any sin that he commits, but by the mouth of two or three witnesses the matter shall be established. So here again, they had set up multiple witnesses, two, three, four, who knows, five, six, half a dozen against Stephen. And because they had... I doubt that there was anything he could have said to deliver himself from their hands because they had followed, in, in a wrong way, of course, to pervert justice, what God said and to accuse somebody, but they did it in order to pervert justice and to do it evil because these guys were lying. Uh, because really, the religious leaders that had come there for that trial had already really judged Stephen. They had, hey, I'm, well, in our law, hey, if there's two or more, that's, that's good enough. Let's get the stones. I don't even know really why they listened to him or he... he he preaches an awesome sermon after this, but, but Stephen probably already knew that he was in trouble. Stephen already probably knew, hey, yeah, I'm not getting out of this, but that doesn't stop him from loving them. And that doesn't stop him from shining like a bright star for Christ. And as the last part of our verse spoke of him, his face was as the face of an angel. He looked so peaceful. He was like, yeah. So his face looking like this tells me that no matter what evil they said that he said, he had God living within him. And he knew in Christ that he didn't say those things. He had, his conscience was clear before God. He knew that he, nor Jesus Christ, had said those evil things. And because these things were so, it leads him to give these evil, hypocritical religious leaders and the sore loser followers of Satan one of the most awesome sermons and rebukes in the whole entire New Testament. And the longest one, I might add, as that's why we had to break it up because I tried to keep my sermons, you know, around anywhere from 45 minutes to an hour. And had I tried to go through all of Stephen's sermon, it would have taken about two or three hours going through a lot of detail because Stephen, man, he gets it. He gets down deep. But we won't get to his sermon today, uh, but it is an awesome one indeed, as we will see next week. In closing for today, though, a couple closes, uh, what can we learn from our text? Well, Christians first. Uh, remember, it didn't matter that Stephen didn't hold the position of a pastor or elder of this church in Jerusalem and that he was only an overseer table server, basically a waiter of a ministry of feeding church members, God used him in a mighty way to do many signs and wonders among the people. And when the time came, God filled him with the wisdom to shut down the sore losers whom Satan sent against him to try to destroy God's work, which they lost again. Satan loses again. He was a man that was full of faith, 
despite his small position in the church, and God saw it and used him in mighty ways. Period. The end. Christians, you don't have to hold the highest position in your church for God to use you. God wants to use you and your talents and the abilities he's given you just as you are. That's just the way the, the Bible says. He is no respecter of persons, as a brother of mine loves to say. He will use a pastor elder the same as he will use a table server, as Stephen is the prime example of this to us today. This is what God is looking for in order to use a child of his, a child of, a child of his, whatever stature you hold in the church. This is what he's looking for. 2 Chronicles 16.9. This is what God's looking for. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. That's what God's looking for. You want to serve God? Is your heart strong towards him and that you are seeking him on a daily basis? You love him by the way you live your life. You live a life of, of fear towards him. The Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Are you eager to serve God. Do you even want to serve God? If you're a real Christian, it should be there. You should sow to that. And lastly, are you asking him to use you? Are you asking him to use you? For God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the called to serve him. Summing up this final point to Christians, for God to use you in a big way for him, he's looking for those who are willing, those who are eager and ready, not for those who are able. So whether you hold a high position in your local church or not, God can use you in a mighty way if you have faith, if you're eager and your heart is strong towards him, just like he did with Stephen. Christians, do you want God to use you in a great way? Prepare yourselves and seek God's face. Really, seek God's face and ask him, Lord, I want to serve you. Lord, I want to serve you. Remember that parable I think I brought up last week about all the, all the Christians or all, all the people that were going to call Christians and, the, and they were waiting and, and the master of the vineyard came out at the, you know, at the 12th hour and the 3rd hour and the 6th hour and the ninth hour. Well, they were there waiting and ready. They weren't sitting on the couch at home. They weren't sitting on a glass of iced tea doing nothing. They were willing and they were waiting for the master to come and choose them to do his work. And then who did God, in that case Christ, who did he choose? He didn't he went to a certain place, a place where they were willing and ready and getting themselves, you know, prepared. He didn't go to each one of their houses and look at the one sitting on the couch, hey you on, on the couch there, come on. Shut your TV show off and get going. He was looking for the one that was willing and ready and able and that was preparing themselves. This is what God wants. Uh, and and of course we have to have faith and we have to trust that God, you know, hey, God used me and that we have to put ourselves out there and say, God, whatever you want, I'm willing to do. And of course, we know the Bible says there's nothing greater than to have faith. For without faith, Hebrews eleven six, it is impossible to please God. Children of God, think on these things and respond, please. God's eyes are looking to and fro upon all the earth right now to see whose heart is strong towards him. And to be honest, just like I said in my last message, most churches need servants desperately. Most, ch most churches are desperate. They, they need lots of people to serve them. And, and God's looking, okay, who's ready? Who's ready? Who's waiting? Who's on their knees in prayer? Who's seeking my face? Who's even asking me? Are you that one? Are you that one? Ask yourself. Changing gears, my last address, well, one last one. Because we can't, we can't put it off here. You see, these guys that came against Stephen, they thought they were people of God, right? They were from a synagogue, right? Well, if they were from a synagogue, right? Well, what are, you, don't think, you don't come from a synagogue and think you're Satan, right? They, think that they, they thought they were of God, right? And they, they, and they hated Stephen for doing what he did. Now, they were blinded and they were deceived. Well, my last close comes to, I have, a, you know, just my question, a big question. If you listen to me wherever you are in the whole world, and, and don't get offended with me here, please. If you do, I'm sorry, but just listen to me all the way through. But my question is, is are you even a real Christian today at all, period, the end? Meaning that, are you born again? If you died today, uh, would you spend the rest of eternity in heaven with God Almighty and Jesus Christ with them forever? Many believe themselves to be, but do not pass the biblical test, just like obviously these guys. 
They didn't pass the biblical test, did they? They all they did. They were liars. They bribed. They they had bear, people ball, bear false witness. Well, that's not a child of God. Child of the Bible says child of God. They don't do things like that. So just like these guys were deceived, are you maybe deceived? You may be saying, Pastor, is there a really biblical test? to see if I really am a child of God, if I'm really saved or not. Yeah, you bet your bottom dollar there absolutely is. Look at them. There's two. And they come out of John's epistle, his first one, uh, not, his, not his gospel, but his epistle. First John 2, 5 and 6. Uh, but whoever keeps his word, there, there's the first thing to be able to tell if you're a real child of God. Do you keep his word? Listen, listen. Truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. If you're keeping his word. Well, that's pretty powerful. So there's a test right there. Verse 6, he who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as Jesus or he or Jesus walked. So are we keeping his word? Are you keeping his word? Are you walking as he walked? Are you living as he lived? 1 John 5, 2 and 3, by this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. The things that Jesus said to do. Are we doing the things that Jesus said to do? For those are his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his, Jesus' commandments. Did Jesus gave lots of commandments, man. I mean, he gave lots. Hundreds, actually. Nobody that I know of, I have to actually look. Maybe somebody has. Nobody that I know of has given the commandments of Jesus, but he gave a lot. I'm big on once you get saved, you better be doing what God said. Because a lot of people, say, I, I, I've actually come, God's been revealing something to me lately, and I've, I've really got to seek his face on it. But there's these shirts that people wear, and I actually have been wearing one, and I saw myself with a picture of one on, and it says, Christianity is not a religion. Well, you know... That's kind of true, but it's kind of not true. It is a religion, but it's not a religion. Loving Jesus Christ and having a relationship with Jesus Christ is not a religion. But the religion of Christianity that Jesus Christ laid down after he died and while he was alive, for, for when he died, is a religion. Go ye therefore to all the earth and preach the gospel. Well, that's something to do. That's a religious duty you call it, that Jesus laid down for Christians to do. Love one another as I have loved you. There is something Jesus Christ laid down as a commandment. Now, you can't tell me that that's not a religious commandment. All the word religion means is a practice of duties. Things, of course, we're supposed to do. That's all a religion is. Now, people have twisted the word religion to mean all oh, religion is bad. But no. Relationship comes first, but there should be a religious relationship with Christ after you're saved. To what? To keep the things that he said. 1 John 2, 6. For whoever keeps his word, what is John saying? Forever, whoever practices the religion that he laid down, truly the love of God is perfected in him. So yes, Religion doesn't save anybody, meaning I can't be saved by doing religious duties, Christians. But you bet your bottom dollar, Jesus Christ laid down religious things to do that his children ought to be doing. As 1 John says, those that are truly saved. When we, uh, by this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. This is the love of God that we keep his commandments commandments. Wow. Which means that if, if you think, if you believed I'm saved and I'm headed for heaven when I die, uh, you must ask yourself these questions of your life. Do you really live for Christ in regards to the ways in which you sin? How easy do you think of sin? How, how eh, just sin. Eh, just sin. Oh, God loves me anyway. I could sin all I want. God loves me. He died for my sins. Eh, that's a wrong way to think about sin. Be holy, for I am holy in all your conduct. Right? Uh, do you live for Christ in your choices of what kind of TV you watch? And what kind of music that you listen to? I know there's a lot of people out there that think TV is evil and all music. Is, but, oh yes, it's all about balance. Are you watching TV shows that totally dishonor God? That's not what a Christian should be doing. 
Are you watching shows that honor God or that just give you some entertainment to take a break when, when you're with your family? Well, there's balance. Or are we spending our whole day in front of the TV? Are we spending our whole day making the TV or music our idol? Well, then this is not from God. But do you live, you really live for Christ in these ways? Do you live your life like you love Jesus Christ in the things that you do, the ways in which you drive? <laughs> do you love Jesus? Can If somebody was around you on the highway, would they be able to know that you love Jesus because you're keeping the speed limit? You're not cutting people off. You don't have a ictus fish on the back of your car and running people off the road or cutting them off, right? Do they, is that you? Because if that's you, well, then you're not, keep, you're not loving others and you're not keeping his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments for. Jesus would not do that. Does your life reflect your keeping his ways, his commandments, his love for humanity? Do, doing the things that he said... And not doing the things that he said not to do. This is how we know who really loves God and who really is on their way to heaven and who's really not. And I'm sorry to say, but the majority I meet claim to be saved and God's kids. But when I examine them through the biblical tests that God gave us through John and his first epistle and other parts of scripture to know who's saved and who's not, well, I don't agree and neither does the Bible agree with their opinion of themselves, that they think that they're saved. When I see what I see with people, when I look at the Bible, when I look at people through the Bible, when I look at the world through the Bible, it's just not just my opinion, it's what the Bible says now. It's not me. Amen. It's I see of people what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 to 24. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. Well, ladies and gentlemen, who calls Jesus Lord? Does a Muslim call Jesus Lord? No. Does a Buddhist call Jesus Lord? Yeah. No. Does a Hindu call Jesus Lord? No. Who calls Jesus Lord? Well, that so either A, somebody that loves him, or B, somebody that thinks that they love him. Yet Jesus just said here, not everyone who calls me Lord is going to get to heaven. Wow. That means that there's some people out there that are calling Jesus Lord, but they're not going to heaven. Because they're deceived. They think they're from, oh, man, I'm from this church. I'm from that church. But yet, Jesus said, you're, you're not going. But he, listen, what, what's, the, what's the difference between those going to heaven and those not? Not whether you call Jesus Lord or you, you know, profess that he's Lord or you call him Jesus. You say you love him. But he who does, Matthew 7, 21, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, done many wonders in your name? Oh, Lord, Lord, we did lots of good works for you. We did this and we did that. And we, Lord, we, man, Lord, we were soldiers for your kingdom. Well, then I'll look at here. Verse 23. Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Wow. They were serving what they thought was Jesus their whole lives, calling him Lord. Yet I will declare that I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Yet, so they served Jesus, they thought, but they also served the life of sin. Well, it's true what Jesus said of them. It isn't that they did, committed a sin here, committed a sin here. They practiced sin willfully in their lives and thought that that was okay. Well, you know, I love Jesus, and you know, because because I go to church, and you know, because I pray, and you know, because I I prayed a prayer and gave my life to Jesus thirty years ago. Well, you know, everybody sins. Yeah, you know, <laughs> sin happens. You know, I mean, I'm I'm not perfect. Okay, I I'm not perfect, and you know what? God loves me just the way I am. But you know, and the thing is, that's a partial truth, which is a terrible lie. God does love everybody, but just because God loves everybody doesn't mean that everybody is saved, according to Jesus here in Matthew chapter 7. So people, please, examine your life in the light of what Scripture says. Nobody is saved because of what they say and how they say they are, they're going to be saved, but people are saved because of what God says. And for what God says, how He says, you must be saved.
Do you believe yourself saved, but God's word says opposite? Do you live a lifestyle of willful, practice sinful behaviors, but think you're a Christian? Or do you live like he lived, and do you pattern your life after his loving righteousness? Hating sinfulness, because Jesus hated sin. Remember the time he drove out the money changers. They were sinning because they made, they made God's house a house of money, a house of, a house of trade. Instead of going there, and just like I said in the beginning of the sermon, did you come here to be entertained or did you come here to be taught? If you came here to be entertained or if you go to church to be entertained, you're making God's house a house of fancy, a house of trade. You're not going there to be taught. And Jesus hated sinfulness. He hated his house being used in a wrong way. Do you, because he lived honestly, not cheating people. Totally trusting in God for everything. Totally laying your life in God's hands. Speaking without profane, utter babble. Using swear words. So many people I know profess to be Christians, yet they have no problem using swear words. Swearing like I said, F this and S this and you know, all this bad. I, I, but yet, they, I, I love Jesus. Does the same mouth of the, does the, same mouth of the, the spring bring forth foul, putrid water, but... Purified waters, well, too? On, on a practice basis now, ladies and gentlemen. I'm not talking about, oh, you know, uh, last year I, I let one curse word slip. Uh, you know, okay, everybody has a moment of weakness in that one thing. Not in one conversation do you swear 25 times and still say, Jesus loves me all. I'm going to say I'm born again. Come on, guys. Jesus let no unclean things slip from his lips. Are you keeping your eyes off the world? and the things of the world, and the love of the world, and the money of the world, and the stuff of this world. And are you keeping your eyes on God and his path? For that's what Jesus did. These are the ways which Jesus lived, and the ways that the Bible said Jesus Christ lived. Don't, if they don't sound like your lifestyle, yet you believe yourself to be a Christian, and saved and inheriting eternal life forever, and simply, you are like these people from this synagogue here. You simply are one of those whom Jesus Christ is talking to in Matthew chapter 7. You are deceived. You're not saved. That's what the Bible says, not me. These people here came to Stephen. They thought they were men of God, yet they weren't. But they thought they were. Do you think you're from God, but you're not really? Look at the Bible. Put your life against the Bible. Look at what the Bible says. If this is you and you realize today you're, you are deceived, well, I, well, I didn't know that. I, I, I prayed a prayer you know, 20 years ago, but I, you know, I never really read the Bible. I didn't know the Bible says all that stuff. Well, if that's you, please, God is saying, turn to Christ today in repentance. Turn now in repentance and surrender. It's how he told his people how to be saved. Matthew 16, 24. If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself. Jesus gave up his life on the cross. He expects you, if you want to be saved, to give up your life to him. That's man. That's step one. Well, but I prayed a prayer. Well, Jesus said, deny yourself. He didn't say pray a prayer. He said, deny yourself. Surrender to me. Then he said, take up your cross. This would be a, 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 a living daily after his ways and putting to death the ways of your flesh, living sinlessly or as much as possible as he gives you light to do so. And then he said, and follow me. Being saved and born again is not because you prayed some prayer years ago. It's a hard decision you made to turn to Christ and make him your Lord and your master. Yeah. If you prayed a prayer but didn't make him your master in your heart of hearts, then you are not born again and you're not saved and you will not inherit eternal life forever when you die. Please be deceived no longer and come to him on his terms today, not your own, and surrender to Jesus and give him your everything and stop playing games with God. Let's pray. Thank you so much, Lord God, for your love. Thank you so much, Lord God, for your truths. Thank, thank you so much, Lord God, for your word. Uh, we, we thank you, Lord, for it. it is a light into our path, Lord. It, it, illuminates, it illuminates everything, Lord. We thank you, Lord God, for all your greatness and your goodness. And we thank you, Lord God, of course, for your, uh, that you offer repentance to sinners. But Lord, what love is that, Lord God? If somebody's been spitting in my face for 20, 30, 40 years, Lord, as a lot of people I know have been spitting in your face for 20, 30, 40 years, the last thing I want to do 
is offer them a way to have a relationship with me. But Lord, that's you, Lord. And I can't understand that kind of love, Lord, because I know it's in me. And I know that it's been in me and you've put it within me for people that have done that to me. And, it, you know, but Lord, I, I don't understand it. It's a love that I, I practice, but I don't understand. And so, Lord, I just, I just pray today, Lord God, for those that are yours. I pray that they would get busy for your kingdom. That Get busy not doing the work until you send them, but, Lord, get, that they'd get busy preparing themselves and asking you to get them ready and being ready to do what you call them to do. Lord, I pray, please, dear God, that they would seek your face and, and ask you to choose them to serve, or ask, ask, ask you to choose them to serve you. Lord, I pray that they would get busy preparing themselves and making their hearts strong towards you, Lord God, so that you would choose them to serve you. For Lord, we know, you know, your church is in desperate need of of faithful followers, of those that are actively wanting to serve you. And Lord, I do pray for those that are right now that uh, that are deceived and maybe they're even listening to this message and maybe they don't even realize it now. God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would break through to them, Lord God, after hearing this and that maybe they don't hear it right now, but tomorrow or later on today, or next week, Lord, something your word said today would strike them in the heart, Lord God, and they'd be just smitten by your Holy Spirit, and they would fall to their knees and truly surrender and give you their all. I thank you, Lord. I love you, and I praise you. And we ask all these things in Jesus Christ's mighty name. Amen.